Hello YouTube. It has been eight months since I have made a video reviewing any sort of a book, but not eight months since I've read a book. Today's book is Bodie Taney's The Gates of Zion. All right, to start off with, I want to tell you a little bit about Bodie Taney and her husband, Brock Taney. Uh, the name is spelled T-H-O-E, no? Yeah, T-H-O-E-N-E, -E, pronounced Taney, not Theon. Um, I went to the internet and their website, and this these authors might not be as familiar to you. Maybe some of you know exactly who they are, maybe some of you don't, so just in case. Bodie and Brock Taney have written over 70 works of historical fiction. Over 35 million of these best-selling novels are in print in 30 languages. Eight ECPA Gold Medallion Awards affirm what millions of readers have already discovered. The Taneys are not only master stylists, but experts at capturing readers' minds and hearts. Bodie's byline appeared in prestigious periodicals such as U.S. News and World Report, The American West, and The Saturday Evening Post. She also worked for John Wayne. Oh, well, John Wayne Batchak Productions and ABC Circle Films as a writer and researcher. John Wayne described her as a writer with talent that captures the people and the times. She has degrees in journalism and communications. In 2016, Bodie's writing returned to the big screen with the release of I'm Not Ashamed, the diary of Rachel Joy Scott, which I've never heard of and which I am now going to watch. Brock is described by Bodie, as an, her husband, as an essential half of the writing team. With degrees in both history and education, Brock has, in his role as researcher and storyline consultant, added the vital dimensions of historical accuracy. Due to such careful research, the Zion Covenant and the Zion Chronicle series are recognized by the American Library Association, as well as Zionist libraries around the world, as classic historical novels and are used to teach history in college classrooms. So... That's amazing. Bodie and Brock have four grown children, Rachel, Jake, Luke, and Ellie, and nine grandchildren. That's a little bonus. All right, so now you know a little bit about the authors. I haven't read a Bodie Taney book since I was in high school. I'd read the Zion Covenant and did not think I had read the Zion Chronicles. My friend did, and she talked about it a lot, but I just never thought I got there. But then as I picked up the Zion Chronicles a couple months ago, I realized that I was wrong because as I read it, I kept thinking, this is very familiar, but I couldn't remember what happened. And then I'd read a little farther and be like, oh yeah, yeah, I remember that, but I still don't know what happens. So it was just vague enough that it was still a surprise to me or still enjoyable enough of a read to continue going because I don't always like to read books twice. I know a lot of people do. Um, there are some books I like to read twice if, if, if enough years have gone by in between, but it always makes it a little more enjoyable if you sort of forget some of so it. So I started to read these books. What I noticed immediately about the Zion Chronicles was the writing style. I love it. It's not the kind of sentence structure that makes me look at the sentence itself like for its cadence or um, uh, flowery adjectives or you know, sometimes a sentence just sounds amazing and you're like, if you're a writer, you might star the edge. <laughs> Maybe even if you're a really voracious reader, you might star that line and just be like, this was a wonderful sentence, this was amazing. That's not necessarily it. I felt more like the writing disappeared off the page and I was immersed into the page. There was, I didn't feel like I was critiquing the writing as sort of a editing on the side. Sometimes the writing really, pulls me out of the story or I think oh that didn't really work but not for this it was like I just didn't think anything at all it just wasn't even a part of my reading it was just the story itself so I really love that I felt like she like that should be sort of the epitome of what we all work towards as writers and and for me maybe maybe not everybody but when when there's nothing to critique, when it just feels like it fades away and you're there, like I think that when the words get out of the way, I guess is what I'm saying. To me, I think that's awesome. As far as the characters go, you can read the Zion Chronicles as a standalone series. It does, um, the Zion Covenant does precede it, but it's, and there are some characters that cross over, but it's not necessary to read the one before the other. The Zion Covenant takes place uh, during World War II, Nazi Germany, a lot of other countries that the books are titled like Prague, I'll just read it to you because 
I'm gonna get it wrong. Vienna Prelude, Prague Counterpoint, Munich Signature, Jerusalem Interlude, Danzig Passage, Warsaw Requiem. Those are six of them. I believe that there's actually nine in this series though. And um, it's about a woman named Elisa who is a violinist and she's in an orchestra. I believe she's Jewish, but takes on an Aryan name during this time where the Nazis are really like persecuting the Jews and, and they're being singled out. Um, but then she has a friend named Leah who is Jewish and looks very Jewish, I guess. And I don't really remember that book very well, but she's more in danger. Um, Elisa has to decide whether or not to take part in the underground um, work of the Jews or those who are helping the Jews during this time. The romance in that is uh, a, a guy named John Murphy who is a reporter and um, or journalist, something like that. Anyway, it's there's a lot of intrigue. It goes through a lot of countries. Like I read about the description of the authors. It covers a lot of history. Um, the romance is there, but it's not the main thrust of the book. It's it's a definitely a main thread, but the intrigue is what really holds you to the book. And all that happens just the and not made up intrigue. It's just the history of the time. It's just fascinating and scary and awful and mind-blowing and eye-opening and all of that sort of thing just because of what went on, what the Nazis did. The next, oh, sorry, back, 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 to, to the romance. The romance continues through the books. I don't remember if they don't get together together till the very end, but their relationship grows and morphs and deepens through these intrigues that happen from book one and on. So you're you're really there with all of the characters for an extended period of time versus a series where you have like one person and then there's another character, uh, one main character and then an, a minor character and then the next book is about the minor character and the next book after that is about a different minor character who becomes the main character. This one really keeps those main characters and it does introduce others, but you don't lose the people you love. Now, the Zion Chronicles picks up with some of those minor characters, though, and, but that's a whole other series. Um, a, a woman named uh, Rachel, uh, I guess in the Zion Covenant, uh, David Meyer is mentioned, a woman named Rachel is mentioned, a little boy named Yaakov, um, Leah and Shimon from the first series are also over there. I don't remember if Ellie Warren, who is the main character, one of the main characters in the Zion Chronicles, if she was mentioned in the Zion Covenant. In fact, I don't remember much about the Zion Covenant, but I researched it a little bit before I made the video. But still, if you've not read the Zion Covenant, you can pick up with these characters very easily. Just pick up the Zion Chronicles and start reading. The Zion Chronicles takes place, um, uh, I might get it wrong, it's 1947, right before Israel became a nation and they're trying to like, parcel up the Palestine area and decide who gets Jerusalem and there's like the old city and the new city and um, a lot of fighting between the Arabs and the Jews. Not unlike today where there is still fighting between the Arabs and the Jews and that won't end until the Lord's return. So we unfortunately are going to continue seeing this sort of history play out. But anyway, that is where the second series picks up right before Israel becomes the history is all there. There's a lot of accuracy. The one thing that I felt like they took some license on was the Dead Sea Scrolls. They mention that um, these main characters that they have, Moshe, is, and I don't know if Moshe is in the first series, regardless. Moshe gets a hold of these Dead Sea Scrolls, and Ellie's uncle gets a hold of them also. And they get passed around from the Bedouins to them, and then they give them to somebody else, and they're sort of hiding them. I read a book about the Dead Sea Scrolls with my kids for homeschooling and that part's not accurate because the book I read went very much into who, how they surfaced in the first place, how they were authenticated, who had them, how they were passed around, how they were preserved, how they were sort of forgotten for a while and then um, resurfaced again. And so there was a lot of that history which did not match the history of the book. So I don't 
that that felt like a lot of license or I don't know what sort of tweaks they made to make that fit because obviously these are fictional characters they're working with. Other than that, I have no issue with the plot because the plot is history um, for the most part and I like the story and the, the romance between the characters. But let me get to the characters. Even though I say you don't need to read the previous series to pick up with these characters, I do wonder, because I have forgotten, I do wonder if these characters were developed a little more at the end of the previous series, because that was one thing for me. When I, when, I, when I started reading the first book, I thought, I don't really feel like I have an in-depth knowledge of who these people are. Now, over time, I'm in the second book now, or at the end of the second book, and I do, I am attached to the characters a lot more. I do still feel that they're flat in some ways. Um, I don't remember feeling that when I first read The Covenant in high school, but I was in high school, and I may, might not have paid attention to those kind of things. So as an example, the romance between, or the short-lived romance between Ellie and Moshe, did not, I never bought it, never, never at all. And when they broke up, that also was like, well, yeah, of course. And, but even that was a little strange the way it happened. And then her relationship with David Meyer was a little bit better. There was a little bit more chemistry. Um, but then Moshe um, moved on to Rachel. I really like the character of Rachel. She's really interesting. She, at 14, was prostituted amongst the Nazi officers and so like she had uh, tattooed on her arm for officers only and she was really embarrassed by that she was really mistreated by the Jewish women um, and some and some other people just because they felt like she was sort of betrayed them and gave in to the Nazis even though she didn't have a choice in the matter so that was a really sad situation um, but the relationship between Moshe and Rachel even though it's sweet and you're like yes you belong together much better than Moshe and Ellie um, she, it was kind of Cinderella-esque, like, you're beautiful and I'm attracted to you and you're in trouble and I want to marry you. Um, that, it just, it, uh, I, not that that couldn't happen and I don't think that Moshe was actually that shallow. I think that he cared about her for deeper reasons, but it's like all those reasons took place off page. Like, there were scenes that could have deepened the relationship. There was conversations that could have happened to let us in on like why he wants to marry her. Like just because she's pretty, just because she's in trouble. And maybe some men just have that fix it. You know, a lot of men have that, I want to fix you, help you, uh, I'm a doer. And that's not bad. And so maybe if they see a woman in distress, they're they're just like, I, I, wanna, I wanna help you. But to jump into marriage for that reason just felt a little fast without those extra scenes to really show sort of an an intimate uh, relationship between them or at least a deeper dialogue um, that could have happened. I mean, she sort of feels the same way. Rachel's attracted to him too, but you can't really recall any one conversation that they had that would suggest they feel like they're actually good for each other. So I don't, that was a little weird for me. But other than that, I do like the characters. I do wish all of those off-page scenes would have been on page. And I'm not saying that the author alluded to off-page scenes, I'm simply saying it felt like there was more out there in the netherworld <laughs> that had to have happened for them to feel this way about each other and we weren't let in on it, so. There you go. I like a, a deeper, more rounded relationship between characters. Don't just tell me they love each other. I want to know why, what, and then let me see the why. That's, that's my preference. I would definitely recommend these books, especially if you're interested in World War II, especially if you're interested in um, uh, the formation of Israel as a nation. If you want like a, a deeper, more sort of Twitter-pated romance, you might want to read something more like Sarah Sundin's books. She has, you know, she's in that era as well, but it's like, yeah, you get a, a better sense, maybe like a little more sexual tension. It's, it's more focused on the relationship itself, 
versus these books that are more focused on the history with a relationship intertwined. There is some sexual tension in it, but it's actually between this, uh, he's not Arab, I'm, I think he's a German, I think he was a Nazi, but now he's working with the Arabs. And he had had Rachel when she was a prostitute or slept with her when she was a prostitute and was sort of obsessed with her again because she's beautiful. And so he, while in Jerusalem, he sees this woman and he's like, is that her? That couldn't be her. But he's been drawing pictures of her all this time. And he's like, thinks because he's obsessed, he feels like she has bewitched him. And so he thinks of her like the devil. And so he is trying to find her again. And he got in big trouble because I think he killed another Nazi officer who wanted to also sleep with Rachel and he wanted her for himself or something like but I that. I feel like since I read it before, I remember a scene where Moshe has to rescue her from this German officer or former German officer. So that's where the tension is. But, and it's, and it's, a, and it's a sweet love story but it's very minor compared to the history. So there you go. So in summary, like I said before, I would recommend these books. For me personally, they they haven't been books this time around that have sort of called to me from the other room. I keep the one I'm reading by my bed and at night before I go to sleep, I'll you know turn on my lamp and read a couple of chapters and put it down and I enjoy it very much. But while I'm homeschooling or while I'm gardening or doing other things around the house, I'm not, it's not calling to me like, come read me, come read me. You know, I just read another book in the midst of reading this one. And that one, even though, like, literarily, <laughs> did I say that word right? It's not as quality. It pulled me from the next room a little bit more. I wanted to get back to it. Not as much as some. I was sort of hoping for a romantic um, plot that would be pretty satisfying. Although at the end, I sort of tossed it. <laughs> I was like, that was not satisfying when I threw it. I won't say it was a waste of my time, but it was poorly executed. So yeah, definitely give these books a try. As for my next book review, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do quite yet. There's some that I've read over these eight months that I want to review so I probably won't read anything new quite yet. I've read um, Jurassic Park. I said I was going to do a review on that and I haven't done that. I want to do The Princess of Mars. I actually ended up making a video on um, John Carter which was created from The Princess of Mars but then I read The Princess of Mars after I watched the movie and I realized I had to redo the whole thing. I can't read any more fresh books right now because I have to finish my own. I'm writing the fifth book of my medieval series called The Lines Have Fallen and I've got some work to do. I have got to get to it. So that has to be my focus and I will just start reviewing these other books that I've already finished. Um, I wish they were a little fresher in my mind but I'll give you my best thoughts on it. I hope you guys have a great day and happy reading.